Go ahead. This just like basically speaks about um breach of trust. Well, we in the trust part, or you mean in from company law side? It's in both. Okay. Well, confidentiality, that's just where you make sure that the client's email isn't leaked. I mean, not email, sorry, the client's information or the information about, you know, the UBOs isn't really um, public. You mm -hmm. know, their records are kept, you know, for the purpose of the company itself, more, not so for public um, view. Like, for example, um, when you are incorporating a company, you know, some things you take to get um, stumped by the registry, but you wouldn't let the registry stump the registered shareholders because that's private information, that's confidential. Okay. All right. And it's a trust, like a trustee's duty to ensure that everything about their client is more so confidential because that too is the purpose of quote unquote trust. Mm -hmm. So not everybody knows who and what or whoever the settlers are, what they are doing or what's the nature of that business in terms of that only that specific company would know who this individual is. Okay, so this confidentiality or as some people say, this secrecy, how did it arise? Where did it come from? Anybody? Someone love it. Continue. Back in the day, oh. in the 1800s. In the 1800s? <laughs> you sure? <laughs> I don't think you went that far. Okay, but I just was saying, um, well, it was established based upon, well, if we go back to like what we learned in the first stage of trust, mm -hmm. that would be based upon, okay, whereas... I give this to you to make sure that my family is covered in the event that I die or I don't return from war. Remember, we had that example, like yes, basically that's to cover the, right, to cover that's my right. earnings. Uh -huh. so that's my the history, history of equity and the use of the trust. Yes. Yes. Okay. So when we talk about confidentiality in its general terms, we have two aspects we can look at confidentiality. One is with reference to the common law, precedence on confidentiality. And the second view is to look at statutory provisions for confidentiality in the Bahamas. So the common law, view of confidentiality was based on the case of Turnier. Anybody heard about that case? Turnier versus National Provincial Bank. Anybody heard about that? No? What happened? Everybody is sleeping. I don't remember the details of it, but I know that it was one of the case studies in our book. You got to remember the details of it. Try. Anybody? It's the pillar upon which our statute is based on. Nobody remembers what Tonya was about? No, but I'm prepared no. to Google search it. Okay, Google search it then. <laughs> okay. I'll wait for the Google searches. Whoever's the first Google searcher can let me know. 
What was the case of turning the air about? The bank disclosed some information about the client who was an the customer to the customer's employee about their unpaid checks. Yes. And remember the information that was disclosed, which was the catalyst for the customer bringing an action in court against the bank. Well, they brought the action because the, the bank, because of that, they, they lost their job. Yes. His employer um, dismissed him because they said that he gambles a lot. Okay. And they let him go. And so in that common law case, it set the jurisprudence as to what is confidentiality. And in that case, the court said, they recognize that that standard of confidentiality is very um, stringent. However, they say um, it cannot be absolute, which means that you have to have exceptions to the rule. And they came about with four exceptions. And what are those four exceptions? Under compulsion of law, it's in the best interest of the public, it is in the best interest of, I guess, in this case, the trustee, mm -hmm. or if they are given express or implied consent to share the information. Yes. So in all of those cases, once you fall into one of those categories, the bank cannot be sued. So is the compulsion of a bank or a trustee to comply with a lawful court order to disclose the de 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 details of a client's account or financial affairs once they have been served. So under compulsion of law, you're talking about where there is a court order or there is an order from the attorney general asking for the trust company to disclose information, client information. So in the case of Barclays Bank versus Taylor, and in the case of Robinson versus CIBC, they demonstrate clearly and unequivocally the fact that courts will not encourage nor allow fishing expeditions. So whenever any um, law firm or any other jurisdiction wishes to obtain information on clients in the Bahamas, they have to go through the attorney general's office. So with regard to the disclosure of clients, banking or financial or other information, in the case of the Bank America Trust case and with Chief Justice um, Gonzalez Savola, it's a Bahamian case and it was on the duty of confidentiality. And in that case, he emphasized the fact that a Bahamian court will not condone attempts by a foreign court to pressure a bank license in the Bahamas but having his parent company in that foreign jurisdiction to violate the banking confidentiality laws of the Bahamas. So how has the international arena dealt with this provision of confidentiality that we have in the Bahamas in common law and also in statute? How have they gotten around that? Would this be like the substance reporting that's one of them, yes. Thing. Okay. That's one. And I suppose but other like legislation boss. will be precious. Huh? What's the next one? Boss, maybe. Yes. Oh. Fatka and CRS stuff too? Oh, yes, wow. all of that. <laughs> all of that is a way of getting around 
that remember once we started passing these legislation and and having the discussion you, see, you always see them talking about the level playing field because slowly by slowly they're beginning to erode that confidentiality which is the pillar upon which we do banking business so the only way we're able is that yes we will collect the information we will collate the information but the information will not be automatically disseminated to any other jurisdiction except for what we do for FATCA and CRS because they have particular thresholds and they are our criteria. So now you know in your mind, you have an idea of how one of the final exam questions will come in this section. Hint? So it will be about explaining Bahamian confidentiality laws um, and the attractiveness of them, and then the way other jurisdictions try to circumvent those laws for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. Or it could okay. be the way in which the confidentiality has erosion, er eroded over the years. Okay. Yeah. It'd be either one. Now, when it comes to confidentiality by statute, the Central Bank in its recent act under the Banks and Cus Companies Regulations Act, Section 77, it speaks about confidentiality. And what that section actually does, it, it enshrines the common law duty of confidentiality in statute. And in that section, let me pull it up, section 77, is no longer called the duty of confidentiality. It is called the preservation of confidentiality. And in that, it speaks to who can divulge, divulge information and to whom. Has anyone read it? Section 77? Yes. I know no? that I know that I have before, but I, I don't want to say that I could remember specifics. Okay, so what it does is put a restriction on those who have access to client information. So it says that if you are a director, an officer, an employee, or agent of any licensee, so that means it's whether it is a bank or a trust company or credit union, or private trust company, or um, I think that's it, trust, yeah. Any one of those, or if you are a former licensee, if you are an attorney or a consultant or auditor, or an employee of an attorney or law firm or consultant or auditor, or if you are an accountant, or a receiver or liquidator, or you're an auditor, or you're an inspector of the central bank, or you are the supervisory authority, or if you are a director, officer, employee of a supervisory authority, and you don't have the express or implied consent of the customer, It says, no person who has acquired information in those capacity can disclose that information. And you can't disclose any information that relates to that individual's identity, their assets, their liabilities, any transactions that they have done or their accounts uh, or related to any application by any person under the act. Excuse me, Ms. Archer, that's section 77 of which? Banks and Trust Companies Regulations Act. Okay, thank you. So where you see in your in your book, it says section 19, subsection 2. Uh-huh. Okay, that section has changed. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. The central bank repealed that act and issued a brand new act and is about to make more amendments again. So don't focus too much on the section mm -hmm. because when they make these other amendments, the numbers may change again. Okay. Right. So it's no longer 19, it's now section 77. That section also um, speaks about cooperation between the domestic regulators, how they can share information. It also speaks about a licensee providing um, legitimate business requests with regard to credit rating. It speaks about the inspector sharing information with the financial intelligence unit. It speaks about the bank with the approval of the governor um, entering into memorandum of understanding with other supervisory bodies around the world. Um, let me see. It also speaks to the inspector um, allowing a head office to receive information from its subsidiary or branch in the Bahamas, as long as it is solely for the pur purpose of collation of information. And of course, you know that the fine, the penalty for breach of confidentiality is $25,000 or a term of imprisonment not exceeding two years or to both the $25,000 and the two years imprisonment. So the penalty hasn't changed. So directly linked to the duty of confidentiality is the Data Protection Act. And every licensee, whether under the Central Bank or the Securities Commission or under the Compliance Commission should have data protection training on an annual basis. So the data protection is all about documentation how it is retained, whether or not you have a policy in place for the statutory retention period for certain documents. It also speaks about the responsibility of the trust company or the corporate service provider, what its duty is to its clients. And what rights does the client have? So if you're operating in an international market, you have to know the Data Protection Act in the Bahamas and the data protection laws in other jurisdictions where your clients reside or does business because you have to be compliant in all of those jurisdictions. So the Data Protection Act is really about privacy principles. Now in the Bahamas, our fines are very small, but when you go to the EU data protection, you will see that the fines are much, much greater. Now I know about four years ago, they said they were in the process of revamping the Data Protection Act and bringing it up to date with other um, jurisdictions. So under the act, it speaks about data and data is about the information that you have stored in your system, the information that you have processed from your clients. Personal data speaks to the information on that living individual. The data controller is the trustee or the financial corporate service provider or the banker. The data processor is the person who processes the data on behalf of the data controller. So that could be your IT department and all of the contractors who assist with the technology in storing data. So the data protection act applies to both public and private sectors. So even all of the government agencies have to comply 
with the Data Protection Act. And of course, the Data Protection Act, similar to the duty of confidentiality, tells you that there are certain instances where information is not confidential under the Data Protection Act. And one of them is when it's a matter of national security. So the Data Protection Act applies only to data controllers who are connected to the Bahamas. So which means that that data controller, that trust company or that financial corporate service provider or that bank must be ordinarily resident here in the Bahamas, incorporated or registered in the Bahamas. An individual who maintains an office that is or a branch agency subsidiary and they practice here in the Bahamas is called a data controller. A data control is not established in the Bahamas, but they use equipment in the Bahamas for processing data that is not restricted to data in transit. So those will also be covered under the Data Protection Act. So in order to protect the privacy of individuals, the data controller must be satisfied that the data that he collected and used fairly and by all lawful means. So if you look at the newly established credit, um, credit risk agency, it falls also under the Data Protection Act. And when you read the credit, it, the credit, the credit agent, the credit rating agency, you would see similar terminology as what's in the Data Protection Act, in that the data they collect must be used fairly and by lawful means. It has to be accurate and it has to be kept up to date. And you only can collect data for a specified purpose. And that per and the data should be adequate and relevant. It can be excessive, which means you cannot, you cannot store more information that is relevant to the service that's being provided. The data should not be disclosed in a manner that is inconsistent for the purpose of which it is kept. So that's the same thing with a credit, rated, credit rating agency. It can only export your information to either a bank or a credit union because that is the purpose for which it was collect, collected. The data should be kept no longer than is necessary except for historical research or statistical data. And that's why in every organization, it should have a retention policy. And the retention policy is based upon one, the type of data it is and the purpose for which it was collated. That determines the period. And the data should be kept securely from unauthorized access. That means that fireproof cabinet under lock, under key, and only certain persons have access. The same thing when it comes to destruction. Destruction doesn't mean that, okay, six years is gone, let me destroy. You have to go back to the original owners of that document to advise that department to say, these documents are up for destruction and I need your permission to do so. And always remember, if you keep your documents over the period, the statutory period and the request is made, you have the information in your company, then you're obliged to provide them. And that's why you should follow the statutory period for retention. The only time that you maintain documents over the statutory period is when the matter is under investigation. So that means under compulsion of law. So an individual has the right of access to their personal data which means they can look at their files, they can see if there's any error, they can ask for it to be corrected. So this right of access doesn't apply to an individual who has financial losses or they're being dishonest or for malpractice and even, even in instances where you owe the Bahamas government taxes. The act does give you the right as an individual for rectification or to ensure that personal data that is inaccurate um, is erased. The individual is also offered the right to prohibit the processing of personal data 
for the purpose of direct marketing. So even though that provision is in the Data Protection Act, when you establish an account with a bank, one of the provisions in that service agreement is that you will permit the bank to market information to you of new products and services. So even though that says they have the right to prohibit, once you sign that service agreement, then you have given your express consent. And remember, that's one of the exceptions to the duty of confidentiality. So the data controller, which is the trust company or the FCSP or the bank has a statutory duty of care. And that duty of care is to all of his clients. And the clients can bring a lawsuit against the trust company for breach of that statutory duty of care. So the trust company has to ensure one, that it has policies and procedures in place. Two, that employees are adhering to the policies and procedures in place. And if there are gaps, that they are addressing it. Three, four, that they are meeting the required period for destruction for documents. So notwithstanding the fact that the Data Protection Act provides protection for disclosure of information, Again, that protection can be overridden in the interest of national security. And that is determined by the police or the defense force. That, that your information can also be disclosed if it's a criminal investigation, if there's prosecution. And like I said earlier, if you owe the Bahamas government tax, and that's referring to value added tax, that's talking about real property tax, that's talking about stamp duty, all of those taxes that are first and foremost before you could obtain any sort of licensing in the Bahamas. Um, your protection can also be overridden when there are international relations and there are issues between jurisdictions. It can be overridden to prevent injury or damage or loss to a person or property and any disclosure required for the purpose of obtaining legal advice, any disclosure made to the data subject concern or to a person acting on his behalf, or any disclosure made at the request or consent of the data subject himself. So if the, if the client gives express consent for information to be disclosed on their behalf, then of course, that the data protection, that disclosure is, per, is permissible. So under section 14 of the act, it provides for the appointment of a data commissioner. The commissioner has the power to issue information. He can enforce and he can prohibit notices. He can appoint officers for the purposes of inspection and examination. And he can also restrict the transfer of personal data to different jurisdictions. Because remember, whenever you are doing business between trust, trustee to trustee across different jurisdictions, the rule is that they must have the equivalent or better in terms of laws. So information or data doesn't move from this jurisdiction to another jurisdiction that has a lesser protection for data that belongs to a client. And it's the same way if you're going to transfer trust. The, the, the jurisdiction is being transferred to must have laws that are comparable to the laws in the Bahamas or even better. Any comments or question on data protection or confidentiality? No, I have a question. I have a Go question. Ahead. Um, just out of one of the mentions you made with when signing in onto a bank, for example, and they're able to market your information, would it be um like say the, the bank uses a third party for marketing, 
and something happens where they are, end up using the bank's client's information in a really ridiculous way, does the client still, because it's a duty of care, even though I'm giving you consent, I'm I'm assuming that there should still be some type of, I guess, management in a way to make sure that that kind of thing doesn't happen. Will a client then have some type of ability to come after you because you gave my information to somebody who did something weird? Yes, yes, they can. Because okay. when you read the service agreement, it's, it explicitly states in terms of marketing to you what that marketing means. Okay. It's, it stipulates that. Okay, I was and just trying normally, to put the yeah. correlation between, I was just trying to like match it up that even though like a client gives consent, we still okay. have to continue to be cautious, right? Like They have that statutory duty of care, yes. Okay. Okay, that answers yeah. my question. Thank you. Right. And so what you'll see what happens is that if, if a, a bank wishes to um, market a product to its customers. Before that, before that, that product is marketed, each jurisdiction has to review their laws to see if they can. Because don't forget now, even though let's say your bank is ABC Bank and you're here in the Bahamas, you may also be in Cayman, you may be in Seychelles, you may be in Liechtenstein. Each one of those jurisdictions has a different piece of legislation with regard to confidentiality and its duty. And so each they may decide to come up with a new product, but then each jurisdiction has to tweak it depending on their local legislation. And so they're very careful when they do that because the bank is trying not to be sued. So they will always dot their I's and cross their T's to make sure that whatever they're promoting or whichever customers they contact that is within the parameter of the provisions that were set out in the service agreement. They'll always check that. Any other comments, questions? I have another question. Go ahead. Um, talking about uh, the client having the ability to see information, I guess that that is that limited just to the information that they have given. And I'm asking this in terms of when we talk about doing due diligence checks, like would a client can I come and say, I'd like to see my profile that you built in the background kind of thing, could they? Um, I know under, the corporate service provider, they do. The clients do come in and ask to see their files. Okay. But on their files, the KYC documentation is not there. Okay. They can see their annual statement. They can see their memo and arts. They can see their resolutions that were prepared that they signed. They can see those, but the KYC is not on the file. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Anything else? Ask now. I won't see you all again until, what is that date again? March 30th. All right, so we talk about the duty of confidentiality. We spoke about the Data Protection Act, which is closely related to that duty of confidentiality. Then the government would have legislated the Computer Misuse Act. And the Computer Misuse Act goes hand in hand with those two legislation. And what the government sought to do is to expand the offenses under which persons would access data in the wrong manner. So they have six offenses under the Computer Misuse Act. One is unauthorized access to computer material. So the law says that if you knowingly or you deliberately, deliberately intend to access information off a computer 
knowing that it is unauthorized, you, you are guilty of an offense. And the fine is $5,000 or six months in jail or both. That's the first time if, you, if you're um, convicted. In the case of a second conviction, the fine and the prison terms are doubled. And they brought this one, the unauthorized access to computer material that was drafted to prevent and minimize the antics and actions of hackers whose purpose for unauthorized access to computer material is mostly recreational. So these people who are just playing on the computer and hack into a person's confidential information. The second offense was access with the intent to commit or facilitate the commission of a crime. So these are those persons who get into a system and then try to get access to a person's account. The offense is committed by any person who gains access to any program or data held in another computer with an intent to commit an offense, whether, whether by himself or by another person. And they may involve property, fraud, dishonesty, or they could even cause bodily harm and they are punishable on conviction to a term of two years or more imprisonment. The access to computer program or data may be authorized or it may be unauthorized. So they're not talking about just a hacker from the outside, but you have someone who's working internally who hacks into the system. And the commission of the offense does not have to occur at the same time as the access. So they're not simultaneous. So any person found guilty of this offense is liable on conviction to a fine of $10,000 or three years imprisonment or both. The next offense is unauthorized modification of computer material. So the legislation says that if you deliberately or knowingly cause the unauthorized modification of the content of any computer, you will be guilty of this offense. And it says, notwithstanding the fact that the data or the program held in the computer may have been affected by the unauthorized modification was not the data or program of the computer, which may have originally utilized or targeted by that person. And it gives you a fine of $10,000 or one year imprisonment or both. If you commit the offense a second time, the fine and the imprison term are doubled. Now, if you cause damage in making this unauthorized modification, you could be fined $20,000 or you can go to jail for three years or both. And when they speak about damage, the legislation has defined what is damage. And damage is any impairment to a computer or the integrity or availability of data or program or system or information that causes economic loss, aggregating to about $10,000 or any other amount as the minister may by notice publish. If you modify or you impair the computer, you potentially modify or impair the medical examination, the diagnosis, the treatment or the care of one or more persons. So you see the legislation doesn't speak just about modification of the computer in terms of the logic, but it also speaks to modification in terms of the data, of the data subject. If you cause or threaten physical injury or death to a person in using that computer, if you threaten the public health or the public safety, or even if you threaten physical damage to a computer, you are you're facing that fine of $20,000 or three years in prison. Unauthorized use or interception of computer service. The access that if you knowingly secure unauthorized access to a computer for the purpose of obtaining directly or indirectly any computer service or intercepts or causes to be intercepted without authority directly or indirectly, any function of a computer by use of a device or you use or cause to be used 
whether it's direct or indirect, the computer to commit an offense, such as an access or intercepting the computer service, it is an offense. And that fine is $10,000 or three years in prison or both. The second time, a maximum fine of $20,000 or three years in prison or both. And of course, if there is any damage, then you have to pay $50,000 or spend five years in prison or both. Then they have the fine for unauthorized obstruction of use of computer. And the fine for that is $10,000 or three years in prison. And the subsequent conviction is $20,000 or five years in prison. And that's talking about when you obstruct a lawful use or functioning of a computer, or you prevent access to a program or data stored in a, in a computer. So unauthorized disclosure of access codes. And this is like for everybody who works in a bank or trust or corporate service providers facility. Any person who knowingly and without authority disclose any password, access code, or any other means of gaining access to any program or data held in a computer for wrongful gain or unlawful purposes, or they disclose the information knowing that it is likely to cause wrongful loss to any person, they are guilty of an offense. And the penalty for that is $10,000 or three years imprisonment. Or if you are convicted, it's $20,000 or five years imprisonment. The act also makes provision for more severe penalties where an offense under the act involves a protected computer. And a protected computer, of course, is one that's under national security or international relations or the police force, the defense force. And in those instances, your fine will be um, up to $100,000 or 20 years imprisonment or both. The act also gives the police wide powers to search and seize under certain specified conditions. And the court has the power to order forfeiture of any property which was in possession or under control of a person convicted of an offense under the Computer Misuse Act. Particularly where such property was used or intended to be used for the purpose of committing or facilitating the commission of an offense. So when you look at the duty of confidentiality and we go back to when we did trust law at the very beginning, the duty of confidentiality and the beneficiary's right to information, how do they correlate? How does section 77 of the Bank and Trust Companies Regulation Act and section 83 of the Trustee Act, how do they correlate? Anybody? Janice, what do you think? Well, I guess the same duty of care is expected. Yes, that's one thing. So you, you're obligated not to disclose information unless um, it's required by law or the the client give you the, the right to disclose the information. That's it, that way? Yes, yes. So under section 83, what is the right of the beneficiary? Now y'all should know this. Under section 83, what's that they, right? They can, there are some things that they can see and some things they can't see. Um, right. Like they can see trust uh, counting, but they can't see minutes. And I think, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that that, can, that goes with the confidentiality um, from section 77 in terms of not specifically about the beneficiary, like the one beneficiary who might have access to the information, but the one who doesn't because you don't want them to have information that they could kind of use against the trust or that could prevent the trust from being administered the way that it's intended to be administered. Right, so section 83 gives the beneficiaries a right. 
Section 77 puts on that trusting that duty of confidentiality. So on one side, you have that right, and one side, you have that duty. And that trustee has to balance between the two. He has to comply with his right of confidentiality, and he also knows that he cannot disclose information that he is not permitted to do so, either under Section 83 of the Trustee Act or as under his duty of confidentiality. So he always has to make sure that he secures that right to confidentiality along with his statutory duty of confidentiality. So whenever he provides information to a beneficiary, it has to enable a beneficiary, beneficiary to determine his own true entitlement of the interest in the, in, in the trust itself. The beneficiary can demand information that he cannot see. And on the opposite side, the trustee cannot disclose information that he cannot give. And then just like we were saying just now, um, what Leah said, the trustee is trying to avoid to disclose information that can cause beneficiaries to, I guess, challenge each other or argue between each other as to who is getting more than the next one. And they do have quite a few cases where you see beneficiaries are arguing the trustees that they're not receiving enough monies under the trust. So a trustee is not to be compelled to disclose to beneficiaries any letter of wishes by the set law or memorandum of wishes. The trustees are not compelled to disclose information or documents by any request for discovery or inspection by the courts. The trustees provide information to beneficiary to enable the beneficiary to determine his own true entitlement. So if I am a beneficiary, you can give me information to a certain extent. The beneficiaries can demand, remember, the trustees' minutes of the meeting nor the correspondent between the trustees, because that falls under the trustee's duty of confidentiality. And if, and if it comes to the trustees exercising his discretion and his deliberation, a beneficiary cannot see that information, even though he has the right to information. But his right, of inf his right to information is trumped with the trustee's duty of confidentiality. So even though the beneficiary has that statutory right and it has that common law right, he has both of those. There's certain information he still cannot have when the trustee exercises his discretion and follows his statutory duty of care. Because whatever right that beneficiary has, the information that is disclosed to him can only be done under the specified conditions and in certain conditions as stated in the trustee. So you all know, and I know you remember that the right to information that a beneficiary has is only available to him if he is vested. If you, are, if you have a contingent interest or you are a contingent beneficiary, you do not have that right to information. So for a trustee, in order for him to ensure that he is preserving his duty of confidentiality, he has to know the difference between his beneficiaries because he needs to know when not to disclose trust information. He needs to know who is not entitled to information in order for him not to be sued by the beneficiaries for breach of duty. Any comments?
Ms. Archer, you mentioned something about the trustee not having to disclose certain information to the court. Did I hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, can you like, repeat that again, please? The trustee, if he has, um, he's not compelled to disclose information or documents by any request for discovery. Because remember now, that trust information itself is confidential. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't just disclose every piece of document that he has. Okay, okay. That's the beauty of the trustee. If anything depends on, on what the argument is, they may just be um, arguing a particular clause or a particular transaction. But they don't go before the court with the whole trustee and pick the whole thing apart from first from line one to the, to the very last sentence. Okay, so only what's applicable. What's applicable, yes. Okay. Ms. Archer, and um, the courts can subpoena information for the trust um, relating to the trust? Yes, they can, but it has to be relevant to what's the issue at hand. Okay. Yeah. Because remember, relevance is key because you're talking about a person's confidential information. So I'm okay. going to leave chapters two and three for Ms. Dorset for Saturday. Remember, I said they're not that long. So hopefully you all will get your books tomorrow for those that didn't get it. Yes? Yes, ma'am. All right. And then you all can read up ahead. And I'll see you all on March the 30th. Sounds good? Sounds good, thank you. Thank you. All right, and I'll have Ms. Dean send you all the grades once I'm finished. Okay, <laughs> have a good night. Yes, have a good night, Deandra. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Good, good night, night, Janice. Good night, Good LaVette, night, Melissa. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>